Anyway, this morning I want to talk to you about it's a setup. And I was wondering, I was asking Tom, like, how many times or have we experienced being set up? And, and I, I don't know if any of you have, been, have you ever been set up by something, whether it's someone trying to sell you something or, or whatever. And to my mind, because I couldn't think of one of my own, it's always better to tell your stories than mine. <laughs> came to my mind one of the precious ladies in our church who was um, believing to uh, get a rental property and it was at that time where rental properties were really hard to uh, get hold of and uh, so finally uh, she was on Gumtree and they had this rental property and they were like yeah you know you you there's so many people though we're not really sure you can put your name down and she did that and she'd seen all the photos and stuff but they hadn't organized people to go look through it yet and this is a short story of it, but uh, one of the ladies that she was regularly talking to who was so nice had said to her, you know what, we've got a couple of hundred applications, but I don't know, something about you I really like. So to be honest, if you, if you put the money through to the, um, the bond through early, I'll actually make sure you get it before the people even go and have a look at it. Yeah. Well, because she'd got to that point where she was pretty desperate for a home, she went ahead with that. And then all of a sudden when she rang the lady back, there is no lady. And, you know, this had obviously been planned. And one of the things I noticed with set up, you're either set up by your kids, you know, they've already asked someone, they've already said, hey, Darcy, can you come over my house? And then they come and ask you, can Darcy come and play? But you already know the mum has left because she thought he was already coming or they play one parent off against another or you've been set up something like that where it's, it's long. And so what they'd done is they'd actually taken a large amount of money off hundreds of people telling every person the same story story and that really gutters you you know like when you realize I've been set up you go through those different feelings of you know how could I be such an idiot uh, you know like all these different emotions that we feel and so I was thinking about times where we're set up it's either really quick like that someone's just thought of it or sometimes it's a whole big scheme of things that someone has plotted and planned to set you up but as I was reading through the Word of God, and especially since probably the beginning of this year, where I've really been saying to our elders and our leaders that I believe God is setting us up. Yeah. And so what I'm going to talk about today is how God sets you up. And no matter what's been happening to you, whether it's been uh, over a week or whether it's been over the last year, or over the last few months, whether it's been over the last 20 years, I want you to be encouraged that you are being set up by God. And so I'm going to look at some different people who, so many that I saw were set up with God. One of my favorites is Joseph. Okay, Joseph, and I'm just going to tell you some of his story. So Joseph, his brothers don't like him. Uh, God gives him a dream. And Joseph comes to his brothers out of the innocent of his heart and says, guess what, I've had this dream. And as he, as he tells the brothers the dream, the brothers hate him. And the brothers throw him into into a pit and eventually they sell Joseph into slavery and Joseph is a slave not for a week not for three months not for six months maybe you're struggling with this corona thing which has been going for about three months and you feel like this is just I can't even see anything good out of this but when you can be confident to go I'm being set up People are like, really, why are you smiling? You're being set up and there's a smile on your face because I'm being set up by God. by God, by God. And so Joseph is then sold into slavery for 13 years. He's a slave. And uh, all sorts of things happen in Joseph's life. But at one point, the, the guy that's got off is in front of Pharaoh. Pharaoh has a dream. And then the, the guy says, oh, I made a mistake about three years ago. I met this guy in jail. He can interpret dreams. And so he brings Joseph out and I don't know about you, but I'm very visual. I imagine how that feels. This is a guy who's in jail. It's not like our kind of jail. They don't have TV and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, they wash him up and bring him out and drag him in and bring him before Pharaoh. And, you know, just even that, the extreme of that, it would have been dark. It would have been dingy. It would have, you know, not been shaven, all of those things. And he's dragged in before Pharaoh and Pharaoh says to him, I hear that you can interpret dreams. Now, if you think about for the last 13 years, you feel like you've been set up. So if that person now, someone else is looking for a property and they then come to you, oh, I, it wasn't there, but oh, I hear you're good at finding rental properties. 
If you were that person that had been set up, you'd be like, hey, don't bother asking me. I got totally scammed. Don't, don't talk to me about it. Think about how Joseph felt. Joseph, they've heard that Joseph can interpret dreams. Remember, this is Joseph who 13 years ago had a dream and it all went wrong. And yet Joseph doesn't do that. And I, I love what Joseph says to Pharaoh. And you can read all of the story in um, Genesis 41, but it's a lot of the different chapters. And we see that when he is then asked to interpret a dream, he says to him, it's quite a funny story. I was going to preach another message called Fat Cows, uh, which is coming. But <laughs> it's like he gives this dream and he says to Pharaoh, ah, oh, God has given you, God is showing you what's going to happen. Well, God wasn't showing Pharaoh what was going to happen. Pharaoh didn't know. He got so desperate, he's brought this guy out of prison. And he said, but God is, going to, God is revealing to you what he's going to do. Have you ever realized that if Joseph hadn't have ended up in slavery, there wouldn't be someone to interpret the dream? Because Pharaoh couldn't interpret the dream. So your God can see 13 years into the future and go, I do want to reveal that there's going to come a famine and that famine is going to um, be or, or right across the nation. How will I do that? I know what I'll do. I'll get Joseph. I'll give him a dream early. I'll get his brothers to dislike him. His brothers will throw him into jail. He'll then be a slave for 13 years. Maybe you feel that happened to you. Well, I've been a slave for the last 13 years since we had these kids. It was your idea. No, God, you're setting me up. Right now, if you're feeling like you've been the servant, you've been the slave for 13 years, you can, you gotta, when your kids are driving you crazy, you can go, God, you're just setting me up. Yeah. There's something about to happen because God needed Joseph to be in that jail to then be released from that jail, to stand before Pharaoh to be able to tell him what the dream was about. So there's, there's something happening. There's no way when Joseph was sitting in jail, you know, say this morning you woke up and this is where you've got to picture these things. You wake up, can you imagine by the end of the day, Darcy, what's going to happen is you're going to be working for, in the, with the Queen, you're going to have a wife, or no, you're, yeah, you'll have a wife, you'll have money and you'll be second in charge to the whole nation. You, you just... Yeah. It's like... But can you imagine Joseph? We're not even, I mean, he's sitting in a nice church right now. This guy was in jail. Imagine if I went to a prison and said, guess what? By later this afternoon, you're going to be out with a wife, with money and be second in charge to the nation that you just ripped off or whatever. This. God was setting him up. And so he gets up and he's got to keep the right attitude because he gets ripped through already feeling like, you know what, I'm sick of this coronavirus. It's not fair. My wife's lost her job. This has happened to us. That's happened to Whatever it might be, whatever is going through your life, whether it's even been the last 15 years, you can read Joseph's story and go, wow, that's awesome. And so in, a, in such a short time, all of a sudden now he's, I mean, this guy didn't even need to go on the internet and date. It's like, he had a wife. Here's a wife. And then she has kids. And I love it. It's two kids, Manasseh and Ephraim. He calls one of his children Manasseh, which means, for God has made me forget all my toils. Mm. Imagine calling your kid that. What's Huddy mean? Blake was telling me his word means handsome or something. He's asking, Kenny, what does your name mean? Kenny was like, what do you mean? He's like, well, my, my name means handsome. Okay, this kid, how good, for God has made me forget all my toils. My toils for the last week, my toils for just labour. No, my toils for the last 13 years where God gave me a dream. My brothers hated me. I've been mistreated. But you know what? I've got that. And then Ephraim, this is even better. Ephraim means, for God has caused me to be fruitful in a land of my affliction. When you can reproduce in a time that seems bad, when you can see the good, when you can produce good out of a bad circumstance. See, we often think, I could produce something good if everything's good for me. But when you can be confident to go, God is setting me up and I'm going to produce in the bad times. I'm going to produce in the, in the toil and the struggles that I'm, I'm having. If you kind of rewind, go back to the clock, you've got uh, Jacob um, over here, Israel. And Israel is in a land that's now in a famine. 
And Israel is, is thinking like, you know, God hasn't provided for us. We're lacking. And so God has to then, sorry, Jake, sorry, Israel has to send his sons on a trip, go to Egypt. So he sends his sons. He would never have sent his sons, it's so amazing, had there not been a famine. And so often, maybe right now that you're praying for God to come through in a particular area. Come on, God, if you love me, you'll do this. God should be doing this. This is what we're praying for. And God seems to be holding off and God seems to bring you into a time of famine, into a time of lack. But when you can be confident to go, that's okay, you're setting me up. I kind of thought I was going to get that teacher job. I kind of thought we were going to get that car. But God, you're setting me up. How often when we don't get the thing that we're asking for, are we confident to go, God, you're setting me up? You know, I was supposed to have that hospital appointment and now it's been postponed. God, you're just setting me up. I was supposed to have a job next week and now I've just injured my leg and I'm on crutches. But God is setting me up. I thought this was going to happen. God is setting me up for something better. So whereas Israel is probably praying, he doesn't realize God is answering his prayer. Because do you realize if Israel wasn't in a place of famine, he would have never been reunited with his son. They would have never come in contact again. So he could be here thinking, you know, God, if you loved me, you would have given me a boyfriend. God, if you loved me, you would have got us to have got that payment. God, if you loved me, you would have done this. No, if God loves me, he's setting me up. And so he sends his boys off on this trip. And so off he sends them on. He tells them to go to Egypt and try and get some food. And... It's, again, it's another great story, but they come and, uh, you know, they get there and they meet Joseph, but they don't know that it's Joseph. And so then Joseph says, well, I think you're, he knows who they are. So he's like, we're going to keep your brother Simeon. And so they keep the brother Simeon and all the other brothers go home. And I love it because one of the other sons is saying to his dad, we need to go back and get Simeon. You know, you probably know, it's like you've got a Simeon in your family. We need to go back to Egypt. Uh, this was not, we need to just pop back to IGA here, okay? This is a 10-day journey away. Then They never came across. And so the brother's saying, we probably need to go back and get Simeon. Uh, we just got to take our little brother with us. And the dad's like, no, nah, we're not doing that. And the Bible says, as you read on in the next chapter, the Bible says that they, they stay there and they just eat all the food. And I wonder what Simeon was thinking at this time. Like, what, what happened? They were just popping home, get, some, get the brother, bring him back. He didn't come back. And the Bible said, and so I asked the dad. The dad says no. So they stay. Well, they, it wasn't down to the local 7-Eleven. Okay, they didn't just pick up Maccas and, and whatever and come back with a day's amount of food. I couldn't work out how long they were back, but they were back a long time. No, we won't worry about it. We'll just leave that one there. We'll eat all the food. And then the food runs out. And so then they're like, okay, well, now we might have to go back. And so then, um, then the brothers are saying, okay, we'll, we'll go back, we'll go back, but we need to take Benjamin with us. And there's so many funny things in the story. One of the brothers that's trying to be confident, he's like, look, okay, if we don't come back, just kill my two kids. Yeah. Imagine the kid's like, what? Can you imagine Blake and Kai? Josh says, okay, look, if I don't come back, just kill Blake and Kai. And they're like, thanks, Dad. Like, just throw us in there and God is working on Judah's heart because it's Judah then that says like you know he's the one that's going to make that sacrifice and it was Judah who originally was the one whose idea it was to sell Joseph in the first place so even if you've got someone right now that's done wrong by you and has spoken against you or isn't talking to you you can be confident to go God's setting me up but no they should come and say sorry to me but they should do this and they should, they should come and validate. No, it's okay. And even if someone says, you know what, they are not going to come and apologize to you. You should be able to smile and go, that's okay. God's obviously setting them up. He's setting me up. He's setting them up. And so they eventually come back. You need to read all these because there's lots of chapters there. And, um, you know, then they find that um, the, 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 they've still got stuff there. And so then the fa- when, when Benjamin comes back and then they find out that the cup's with Benjamin and then uh, Joseph's going to keep Benjamin and it's Judah who says, take my life instead. It's, it's an f- amazing story. And he says this, because my father's whole life is in that boy. 
Where did the jealousy go? Remember the whole reason they didn't like Joseph was because it was his father's favourite? So God's brought them. He set them up. He's brought jo Judah back to the same place. This is his favourite son. But I know the way we did it before didn't work. So he's dealing with the same emotions, but God was setting Judah up. Judah right now, and God's got a plan for him and his life, but because of his jealousy with his brother, he sells his brother into uh, slavery. And 13 years later, well, actually more than that, you can add another nine because they've had the seven good years of famine and now it's two years later that the brothers have come. So we add another nine years, so it's 22 years later. God's still going, okay, Judah, I'm still dealing with that attitude. Yeah. Same attitude, same situation. How are you going to deal with it? Sometimes God's setting you up because he's like, you still haven't got over this issue, buddy. And I'm just going to keep bringing you back and bringing you back to it till you learn to deal with it. God's setting me up. If he's bringing it back in front of you, whether it's jealousy, anger, uh, whatever, he's like, I'll just keep bringing it back up to you until you're prepared to face it. I wrote here, Joseph was a slave, but he was free. Yeah. His brothers were free, but they were enslaved. Because for those 22 years, they still, their whole mind all the time was, you know, this is because we did this. This is because we did this. This is if we hadn't have done this. And Joseph's listening to them at one point. And, and the Bible says he starts to weep because he can see they're still carrying that same guilt. Maybe that's you. You're still carrying the same guilt from 22 years ago. And God's just trying to set you up to go, You've got to let it go. And I love this in Genesis chapter 50, verse 19. This is Joseph speaking, Genesis 50, verse 19. He says, Do not be afraid, for I am in the place of God. You meant evil for me, but God has meant it for good. You know, church, that's the confidence we can have. do not matter what anyone is trying to do to you. It, you know what? You, you, can't, you can't actually harm me. Don't matter what you do. You can take me out of a job because God's just always setting me up for something better. Whatever anyone meant for evil, wherever this coronavirus came, whether it was from a monkey or from a test tube, I don't know. It really doesn't matter because God's just setting us up. We've seen even as a church in the last few months, God's just setting us up. People are saying to us, oh, you know what will happen though? Once church and there are people then want not, not want to go. We've like added three, three couples since we stopped. And a, and a baby. Well, that was kind of, God was setting that up, but um, yeah, whatever. Do you know what I mean? Like, so God is still bringing in. And then we had visitors last week. We were not even sure where they come because God is setting us up. But if I don't see that, I could be like, oh, yes, you're right. It's all going to, it's all about what's happening in me knowing you know this is a good thing God is setting us up I don't care what you see on the news you need to know God is setting us up instead of me saying I'll go out in the fellowship room oh, did you see what happened about this Josh and oh what about that we should be like oh it's so good did you see that's God is setting us up for something better God is setting us up for something better we don't need to be moved by that so three things that that will take one of them is this lovely word called waiting ah. waiting Part of God setting you up is a waiting. Let me show you how I know this. Okay, in the book of Luke is a story about Simeon and, um, a different Simeon, but Simeon and Anna. And the Bible says that they are waiting for the, the coming Messiah, the comforter, the Bible says. They're waiting for the comfort, comforter. The Bible says that this lady waited 84 years. Ooh, come on. Bonnie, there's some hope still. 84 years. <laughs> 84 years, maybe you're waiting, maybe someone else, you're waiting for a new husband, whatever, uh, like whatever you're waiting for. 80, seriously, it said she waited and prayed and fasted for 84 years. Do you know most of us have come to a prayer meeting for a few months and as soon as we didn't get what we want, we don't want to do it anymore? Or a week, I already prayed for that and it didn't happen. Aren't you prepared to pray for 84 years? That's where God wants to get us. Because when you know God, she knew God's setting us up here. There's going to come a Messiah. And I wonder how many other people gave up and said, you're a crazy old fool. I'm not saying. She stayed believing. And then one day, in comes this baby, like little baby James. And then she just knows. The Bible says that Simeon is also waiting. And the Bible said he's led by the Spirit to go to the temple that day. 
There are places where God's trying to lead you by the Spirit to talk to someone, to do something, to whatever it might be, apply for that job. Oh, well, I don't know. God's trying to lead us and if we will listen to the Holy Spirit and let it quicken our hearts, he'll move us. Because Simeon had also been waiting and the Spirit of God is so alive in us today. If you will let him move you, show you. But so often we're moved by the, the, the news and the world. I'm so sick of hearing what the news says rather than what the Spirit says. The Spirit says we are united. The Spirit says we are at one. The Spirit says that God came and he gave us a spirit of reconciliation. So I don't really care what the news says. My Bible says, my God says, Spirit of reconciliation. My God says that we are one. My God says we are more than overcomers. I could go on. There's so many things. And God is setting us up. But he might be just saying, right now, I just need you to wait. Wait. So the question is right now, what is it that you're believing for that God's just saying, I just need you to wait? Do what? How long? 80, maybe 84 years. Was the Messiah worth waiting for? She was there waiting. Number two, what it'll deal with is in this time of God setting us up, he's looking for your attitude. Your attitude. Genesis 24 tells a great story about Rebecca. Rebecca and uh, Eli Eliezer is coming looking for a wife for uh, his, his master, for Isaac. God's checking your attitude. Why should I make the cups of tea? Why should I have to do it? I didn't get what I wanted. Why should I come and do setup? Why should I do this? Why should I have to do that? Why would I have to babysit people's kids? I'm waiting for my own kids. Why should I have God's looking at your attitude in that time? He's setting you up to see what you will do. What will you do? What's your attitude like? So for Rebecca, she's not married. Uh, things are probably not going her way. To not be married in those days was a big time thing for her and yet the Bible says that when Eliezer the servant came this is not Isaac the good-looking dude long blonde hair oh yeah I'll, I'll serve him this is a servant that she decides she is going to feed all of his camels and I've told you before that's like a lot of gallons of water because it's about 25 gallons per camel that she's got to keep doing for the servant she did not know that it was attached to some good-looking guy who she was going to get to marry. She didn't know that. They're too far apart. She had no idea. So right now, whatever it is you might do, someone might spill coffee afterwards and you might get down on your hands and knees and might mop, mop that up. But if you knew it was attached to $1,000 or if you knew that it was attached to a, a, a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a car or whatever it might be that you're believing for, would you do it? Oh, yeah, I'd do it if, if, if it was there for that. Of course I would. What do I get out of it? But there's got to come a heart where God's going, I'm just looking at your attitude. Yeah. Well, no, I want to be the worship leader and they don't even notice me in this church. I'm trying to get past all these puddles and biscuits and whatever it might be. It might be in your workplace where you're expecting a promotion and God's going, but I notice you don't do the little things. Yeah, but that's because I'm manage management material. I'm management material. I'm not going to go do that. How different would it be if you understood that it was attached to something and it's attached to your attitude and your attitude determines your altitude as to how you do things. Attitude is a huge thing. Ruth, I love the story with Ruth and Naomi in the book of Judges. She's the same. She decides that she will follow Naomi and look after her. And she's the one that goes out in the field and she's the one that's doing the work and looking after the mother-in-law. Now, from her point of view, she's, she's not an ideal catch, let me tell you, okay? She has no job. Uh, she's not a virgin. She has no finances. She's a foreigner. So she has nothing going for her. And she must be thinking like, why is this happening? She even comes with a double do scoop on deal, buy one, get one free. Because if you get her, you get the mother-in-law. Be careful of those catches. Like I said, someone could be setting you up, okay? Boaz is rich, good-looking, in charge of so much. 
But when she came and she started gleaning in that field, she had no idea that God was looking for her attitude. To put her in such a great line, even historically, will you go in the field and work? Will you do the little jobs? God's going, what's your attitude like? What's your attitude like? What's your attitude like with your, with your children? What's your attitude like with your teachers? What's your attitude like with your bosses or your peers? Because God's setting you up. Yes. God's setting you up to see what your attitude is like. And the last one, number three, in the whole thing of setting us up is forgiveness. There's forgiveness. God is sometimes, well, really all the time, setting us up in that place and he's looking at our forgiveness and sometimes it's hard for us to see that God is going to forgive us one of the hardest stories that I struggle with is in 2nd Samuel chapter 11 it's the story of David and Bathsheba it goes against all biblical teaching on how we should work situations so it really kind of does my head in of okay so New Testament should be more grace when I look at what God did with David and Bathsheba it's a very different story very challenging story for you, especially if you're in leadership. And I, I don't really know where I'm working this one out of at the moment, but the story is that David, obviously, he wants Bathsheba. She's already married. He sleeps with Bathsheba. And, you know, we kind of go, but if your heart is repentant, God forgives you. But there's lots of unusual things in there because if you actually look at the time frame, so David sleeps with Bathsheba, finds out she's pregnant, realises, uh-oh, this is going to get me in trouble. This is the quick version. Uh, so then he tries to get the husband to come home to be with her, but that doesn't work. So then he tries again. That doesn't work. We kill him. Okay, so poor Uriah actually goes with his own death sentence in his hand and he gets killed. David is not repentant. Okay, when we say David had a, a heart after God, he did, but he certainly wasn't repentant at this time. The child is then born. Okay, and then Nathan the prophet does come to David, gives him the whole scenario of, you know, a man had these sheep and da 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 and David's like, oh, that's so bad. And that man should be killed for that. God's sometimes going to bring you and put you in that position. I can't believe someone would do that to their wife. God goes, I'm setting you up. <laughs> I'm setting you up because maybe you should have gone and said sorry to your wife. I can't believe that people would do that with their children. It's just so, so good parenting. God's setting you up to see what will happen when the tables are turned. And then finally, when Nathan the prophet says to David, this is you, the Bible says that David is then repentant. And it's when he got caught. He never got to a point, and that's always a sad place. When you get to a point that, yes, you've confessed your sins, but only because somebody's found them out, it's not really the ideal place to be. The better place to be is when you know that you've done wrong and you come forward and you confess your sins and you are repentant. See, we would know as well with our children, it's not about just saying, um, well, if I confess my sins, I'm forgiven. Because you've probably got kids too that go like, oh, well, we're sorry. Or sorry. It's not really out of a true heart. Repentance means to stop doing it and to turn and go the other way. If, if I just keep saying, oh, well, I'm really sorry about that, I repent of that, I've prayed, I've asked God to forgive me, but I go and do the same thing again. Repentance is actually realising, and it's not about getting caught, it's about actually going, you know, that was wrong. But the reason I think this story is amazing is, why did God not just take David straight away and not make him king? He's done it lots of other times in the Word of God. Why did he leave him as king? Could have just said, Okay, now this person's king. He'd done that many times before. Why did he wait so long? The Bible actually says that the baby was a child when it died. It didn't even say it was a baby. So God had left it that long. I believe because a lot of times God will leave you in a place where you realise there is, although there is forgiveness of sin, there's consequences. And, and when Nathan actually says to David, you know, you're not going to get killed, but these will be the consequences. And David walked out those consequences of what happened with Bathsheba for a long, long time. But God did still set him up in a place of forgiveness. The other person of forgiveness. See, David, what I was saying with David is, David still brought the lineage of Jesus through him. So he's still setting him up. So even if you've totally stuffed up, God goes, that's okay, I'm still, I'm still a forgiving God. 
I'm still setting you up for something better if you will stay on that path. If you will be truly repentant, I will set you up for something. I'm not going to, he doesn't wipe everything off you and take everything off you. He just sets you up again and says, if you're truly repentant, this is the way to go. He did it with Samson. Anyone that reads Samson's story is forever like, oh gosh, the guy was just so, so silly. And when I then relate it to things that we might have done again and again, and again. Well, how could he not see it? God goes, how could you not see it? You know, you do the same things and then you get out of that and then you go and do the same thing again. And then you cry and you repent and you say you're never going to do it again and then you go and do the same thing again. But when Samson finally repented and asked God to forgive him, God set him up. Of all the places in the whole building he could be is next to two columns that when those two columns come down, the Bible says that more people were killed than ever before in that whole time. Two poles. There had to be a lot of poles in that building. Okay, God still set him up. Because if we will have a repentant heart, God will still set you up for something good. I will still let you have way over your enemy. I will still let good things happen to you. If you are truly repentant, I will set you up for something really good. The other person that did the same was Peter. And it was funny because late last night I was listening to Pastor Tom's message because I wasn't um, in this auditorium last week. And then I was like, oh no, I think that's exactly what he preached. But it was the same story but something else. What I like is Peter who has denied Christ. Okay, that was wrong. Okay, who's missed out, who's now gone fishing. And there he is. And maybe that's where you've been. I'm just going to sit in the boat. I'm just going to go back and do what I've always done before because I just totally stuffed up. God's never going to forgive me. And Jesus calls to him from the shore. What are you doing? Might be saying the same thing to you. What are you doing? Yeah, well, I, you know, I just stuffed. Yeah, but what are you doing? And I love what he says. They, they're saying, we fished all night. And I love what Pastor said last week. Maybe God made it. There's no fish, which he's setting us up for. But he actually says this. Put your net on the right side. The right side, church. God's just going, live your life on the right side, church. Live your life on the right side. Yes, I've forgiven you, but you've still got to live your life on the right side. See, one of the problems when we understand the grace of God, we can misinterpret it. And I was sharing with my grandkids last week and I was saying to them, it, sin is like this. If I um, build up a whole load of speeding fines and I then go to court, and this really means I'm going to get jailed for what it is, and the fine is huge, and someone steps up and says, I will pay that fine for you, then I'm like, wow, that, he paid the whole price. I don't have to go to jail. I don't have to pay those fines. I said, but the mistake Christians make, misunderstanding the grace of God, goes, so that means I can go back out and speed. <laughs> and if you speed again, Jesus will pay the fine. Not literally, trust me, you should take that one to the police station. But do you know what I'm saying? So we think, so then I can continue to sin because I'm saved by grace. No, his word is clear what is right and wrong for us to live by. And in the process, he will always help you out. But when you get that blasé to say, oh, I can just speed now because it makes no difference because he'll just pay the price. Then we have the wrong attitude. But when we see what Jesus is setting us up for, even in that, so he tells them, go and fish on the right side. And then he says, catch some fish and, and bring, he actually tells him, bring some of your fish here. He's already cooked breakfast. It's like me saying to you guys, come over, but bring your own bacon. But when you get there, it's already cooked. See, Jesus doesn't really need what you have to bring. <laughs> he just wants to see if you'll bring it if he asks you. He's setting you up. Why should I have to take bacon? You should pay. They've, they've got more money than us. They should bribe. What do you mean bring your own bacon? We might do that next time. Bring your own bacon. But God sometimes is just going, checking on your attitude, checking on your waiting, checking on the things that he's asking you to do to still come. And he does that in a way with you. He asks you to bring something, but really he's already got it all cooked, already. He's just wanting to set us up. And what does he ask Peter? Peter who denied him, he just wants to say, do you love me? Do you love me? And we could get into the whole agape, phile love. But really all God is saying is, do you actually love me? Are you really sorry for what you did? Then it's okay because guess what? I'm going to set you up for something better. 
God is going to set us up, church. I want to encourage you, no matter what you are going through right now, no matter how long you've been waiting, no matter what you've been believing for, when you get more tenacious in your prayer to go, that's okay, God, you're setting me up. You're setting me up. If things are struggling at home, if things are hard, if you're struggling with your kids, your family, your wife, whatever it might be, your finances, get confident. Get with other people that will see something good and go, man, God must be setting you up then. Some of you here have got sickness and pain. You've got to be, okay, God, you're setting me up. As I was just focusing on this word on, on Friday, I left the shopping centre here and I was about to leave the shopping centre. I was going round the roundabout and the, the car in front of me, I don't even know how, was coming down way too fast and he span out on the roundabout and my, he turned sideways on the roundabout and my car nearly hit him. And I kind of just sat there in, in shock and just for a minute, I thought back about when I was in the shop and the girl in the shop tried to sell me some sort of tickety thing. And I could have just, oh no, no thanks. But I just stopped for two seconds and I just typed and I said, I bet you that's management asking you to do it. I said, it's not easy to do that, is it? I said, you know, have a good day. And I can't remember what else I said and I left. And I realised afterwards, God, you're setting me up. Because if I just said no and walked off, my car would have hit this guy. And then when I got to the office, I was still a bit shaken and then uh, our friend Kevin came in and I was telling him and he just stood there with this shocked look on his face and he went, exactly the same thing happened to me. He said, I got out of my car to go do something and my um, key remote fell on the floor and it smashed. And they're so expensive, those key remotes. And he said, and I'm picking up the pieces and I was just thinking, why, why, why with this? And he said, and I picked all the pieces up and I got in the car and then I headed down the road and I think it was a semi-trailer or something had overturned or whatever. And he said, if my remote hadn't have broken, that would have been me as well. 15 seconds difference. So maybe your fridge broke down, maybe something happened, but when you can be confident that God loves you, yeah, and he's setting you up. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you. We thank you, Lord, Father God, for the toils and the trials that you put us through or let us go through, we should say. Father, like Joseph, let us see that you are setting us up. Father God, you took 22 years to see something good come out of his life. And Father God, it might be that long for us. It might be longer. It might be like Anna, um, Anna and Simeon, Father God. But Lord, help us to see you are setting us up. Father, as people that do wrong by us set us up, Lord, you set us up for great things. I pray a blessing. I pray excitement, Father God, over the body of Christ, Lord, that you are setting us up, that no weapon formed against us can prosper, Father God, and we don't live by the news or by what we see, but we live by faith in the Son of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.